So I think a lot of what we're going to be talking about, a lot of what we're going to be hearing at this conference is about the amazing progress that OpenStreetMap has made over the 10 or 11 years that we've been going. And we are now at the situation where every minute, every hour, every day, someone is editing OpenStreetMap. And this is what I mean by the map that never sleeps. This is this amazing, continually updating, regenerating, growing database of what's actually here in the world. And it's, it's an astonishing thing. We are rightly proud of it. But we often tend to look at our progress and our achievements in terms of the big numbers. You know, we talk about 3 billion nodes, 300 million ways, 2 million users, 25,000 editors a month. And these are all great big statistics, but they tend to actually mask the individual stories. And the individual stories are the really interesting bit, the reasons why people contribute to OpenStreetMap. Because everyone who contributes to OpenStreetMap has their own reason for doing so. Everyone is doing so for something that's personal, something that's heartfelt for them. And that's what makes us so successful, so interesting, so chaotic, I suppose you could say. And it's what distinguishes us from the other big mapping suppliers, that if you are... Google, or if you are um, Navtech, Nokia, or if you are TomTom, then they have a focus. They have lots of people working towards a particular focus. We don't. We are making our own map for the reasons we want to. So I wanted to get a bit of a sort of visualization, a bit of a heads up into what makes people contribute to OpenStreetMap. And so I asked, I asked about a month ago, um, put the call out there on Twitter, on the OpenStreetMap diary, on the mailing lists, a few other places, to say, what's your story? What made you start contributing to OpenStreetMap. And so I'd like to look at a few of those today. Altruism, saving the world like that little cat there. Um, altruism has always been something that's part of OpenStreetMap and it really had to be from the very start because if you think of contributing to OpenStreetMap back in 2005, you weren't doing it because you were going to get something out of it. There was no way that you were going to get something out of OpenStreetMap in 2005. There just wasn't enough data there for it to be useful to people much. So you had to believe in it. You had to believe in what it was and what it might become. And this is, this is a quote I quite like from a story that someone sent me. Um, he didn't get it at first. And then he got it. And the reason he got it is because he went to an ordnance survey event. And everyone was saying, ah, oh, now this OpenStreetMap thing's a load of crap. It won't work. Uh, so he thought, oh, OK, if all these people are a bit... Um, a bit annoyed with OpenStreetMap, but there might be something in it. And so, you know, some people started to get it. Um, this, is, this was actually from Steve Chilton, who's played a big role in the project over the years. Um, he invited Steve Coast, the founder, to speak at Society of Cartographers Conference in Britain. Uh, and he thought, yeah, this is a great project. Never going to work. But again, he went on to become a contributor, and he was doing it not for reasons that he was going to get something out of it, but because he believed in the project, because he thought that it was a great idea. And altruism has always been a part of OpenStreetMap from the very start right to the present day like that. And I suppose the best example of it right now is the humanitarian OpenStreetMap team, HOT. You know, that is absolutely um, altruism in evidence, making uh, a difference to people around the world and um, doing it through OpenStreetMap. For many people, HOT is and continues to be their OpenStreetMap story. I have to have, to have a uh, picture of the uh, traditional stereotype of OpenStreetMap contributors, but this was very much true in the early days. This was, uh, the community back then was small. Um, Venn diagram of um, beards, bikes, and ale. And um, yeah, there's still quite a lot of that around. But one of the reasons that people contribute and one of the reasons people put in their, um, uh, in their stories that they sent me was sharing knowledge. And that sounds all very dry and uh, very noble, but actually, let's give it a slightly snazzier name. Let's call it geo-gossip, because what gossip is, is that you have a secret and you want to tell people about it. Maybe you know about a little secret cut-through. Um, maybe you know about an alleyway, and it's not on any other maps. So... This was one of the stories. This is from a chap in Russia. Um, I started contributing because there were all these pedestrian crossings across railway lines that no one knows about. So I wanted to tell people about them. And I find that interesting because it's mostly altruistic. It's mostly I've got some knowledge and I want to tell people about it. But it's not entirely. If you do some reading about the psychology of gossip, then it's you know sharing little known knowledge actually reflects well on you as someone who had the knowledge first. And being viewed as a top contributor has always been something that motivates people to contribute to OpenStreetMap. Um, we're not all necessarily godlike, but I thought that, uh, that quote from the early days summed things up rather nicely. 
And that's not just on a personal level. Uh, it's on a, um, on a local and regional level as well. Kate was saying in her talk how uh, she started contributing because um, uh, she wanted to sort of pull one over on the posh neighbourhood next door. Um, we had that in Britain a bit as well, in that Cambridge was one of the first cities to be really well mapped. So those of us, uh, a few counties away in Oxford, the great rival in Cambridge over so many years, thought, well, we can't let those fen dwellers get one over on us. So we started trying to catch them up. Another reason is simply because mapping is fun. Exploring is fun, surveying is fun. Um, this picture here is one I've taken from my own personal OpenStreetMap story, which was, you know, ba back in the early days, I was surveying a few canals around Britain, and I sort of knew that this great structure was here. It's this thing called Presto Lee Aqueduct. It's in North Manchester in England. I sort of knew it was there. I didn't quite know how big it was and how cool it was. And so when I went out with my GPS set and the camera, and I saw this, I thought, holy whatever, you know, this is just, this is amazing stuff. And I was actually literally bowled over the first time I saw this. And the only reason I got to see it was because I was going out there for OpenStreetMap. Now, certainly in the early days, there were, you know, days and days of these sort of discovering the world through being an OpenStreetMap mapper. But it, is, it can still be like this. Um, this is a story from the early days, but even then, you know, uh, last week I realised there was a bridleway about two miles from my house which I'd never cycled along. Um, it needed a surface tag in OpenStreetMap because surface tags are useful if you want to know where you can cycle. So I went along, cycled it, great fun, and you know, that was partly for fun, partly to get that surface tag in there. So all good. I think though, what came through from the stories that I got from people was that when OpenStreetMap really started to take off, when the contributors really started arriving, was when the map started to become useful. When I asked people for their stories, the reasons that came up again and again and again were that they wanted a walking map or that they wanted a cycling map. And this is a popular walking area in Wales. This is the Brecon Beacons. Lovely place. It was one of the first national parks in Britain to be mapped really well in OpenStreetMap. And what's interesting is that people then found that OpenStreetMap was the, the best and certainly the cheapest electronic map that you could get of areas like that. So they started loading OpenStreetMap onto their Garmin's or whatever and taking it with them to areas like that that had been well mapped. They then had that device and they then went out and when they went somewhere else that hadn't been so well mapped, they started filling in the details themselves. So you could say that the popular areas like that sort of acted as a tipping point, sort of acted as an advert for the rest of the concept of OpenStreetMap and people went from there. And so here's a couple of stories from people who are doing walking maps. That's um, one who, uh, a chap who went to India first and then went ac across to Ireland. This is um, another one, you know, this is the, the breadth and the scope of the data we have. Someone saying, yeah, you know, I wanted some walking data for the Western Himalayas. And that's, you know, that's superb. That is data that you really can't get anywhere else. Cycling, of course. I have a theory about, well, I have a lot of theories about cycling, which is why I'm wearing a cycling t-shirt. But um, cycling in OpenStreetMap, I think, is really interesting because it's kind of like a canary in the coal mine, that it's an indication that when cyclists start using OpenStreetMap, you realize that the data for a particular area has started to get really good, has started to reach this particular level. Cyclists are often among the first to jump ship and use OpenStreetMap rather than other mapping providers because, frankly, historically bike maps have not been very good. We are the first people to be providing them with good stuff. So that, that's just an example of um, someone who genuinely didn't have anywhere to get good cycling mapping, good cycling data beforehand. Um, now he does, and that's thanks to OpenStreetMap. This is an example of how in Europe, OpenStreetMap is now the standard cycling data provider, you know, heads and shoulders above anyone else. In the middle, that's a paper map done by uh, Sustrans, the uh, UK cycling charity. On either side are um, handlebar-mounted GPS devices. The one on the right is Mio, who have been using um, open, uh, OpenStreetMap data for a few years. The one on the left is a Garmin Etrex. Garmin Etrex is in Europe now ship with OpenStreetMap data preloaded, and this is you know this is wonderful. This is a sort of poetic justification for what we've been doing because 10 years ago when we started mapping OpenStreetMap, we were using Garmin Etrexes to go and survey. You know the little yellow ones that were all the thing back then. Now, things have come full circle to the extent that Garmin now ships with OpenStreetMap built in, and I think that's absolutely brilliant. But that's, that's Europe, all three of those are European products. And so, what about, this is state of the map US, what about the US, what about cycling data in the US? 
Well, I think here the canary is starting to chirp that um, the data in the US is now up to a standard where it's good enough for uh, widespread cycling usage. And so for my little announcement today, I would like to announce that the website I run, cycle.travel, uh, is as of today providing bike directions and bike cartography for the USA and Canada. All done from OpenStreetMap data, all done from the data that you and I contribute done with a fantastic OSRM routing engine and with a huge amount of, stable, um, of uh, personalization and customization in there to make it appropriate and suitable for bikes. So a couple of examples. <laughs> Thank you. This, this, is a, um, this is an example here in uh, New York. This is what happens if you ask it from where we are now to give you directions to Newark Airport. And you can see it's taking you across on uh, bike-friendly streets then down the Greenway on the uh, western side. But what I think is actually possibly more significant or more interesting than that is that this is a cross-country route. This is actually what you get if you ask it for a route from uh, New York, San Francisco. Uh, and OSRM is wonderful. OSRM doesn't break sweat if you ask it for uh, a 3,300 mile route. It just, you know, does it instantly like that. Uh, and you can see it's routing you on proper roads. It's routing you on decent quality routes um, that are not completely clogged with trucks, that are not up crazy hills. But it's not taking you down, down dirt tracks or drainage ditches instead. And that's always been one of the challenges with the rural data in the US and OpenStreetMap, that we don't necessarily have the differentiation between a dirt track and a paved road. Well, it can be done. And I'm really pleased that the data has got to such a state that we've done that. So that's what it does. These are a few of the features. Um, it's now US, Canada, UK, and Western Europe. Draggable routes like OSRM does. Um, avoids hills, avoids busy roads, uh, and as you can see, doesn't unreservedly trust unreviewed Tiger. And what that means is that it's a bit skeptical about any data that came into OpenStreetMap uh, in the big Tiger import in the US and hasn't been touched since then. It downrates that. Um, I just couldn't resist a, a little quote from a French user of uh, cycle.travel at the bottom, uh, which is that the uh, cycle-specific routing on cycle.travel is uh, deliciously well calibrated. I think being delicious is good. I like to be delicious. So, anyway, enough of the plug. Next chapter, going back to people's stories. How do we make OpenStreetMap a part of more people's stories? How do we go from where we are to get more users? And we've heard the voices behind the stories. I've read a few of them out. But the voices, these people, or this is us a couple of years ago at State Map in Portland, um, the voices, there are many different voices, but we all speak one language so far, um, not universally, but mostly we all speak computer. Um, we are from a, cer a certain background, a certain um, social, socio-economic background to some degree. Um, and, you know, I don't want to sort of diss the project and diss ourselves because of that, because it's very easy to be sneery about a project run by and for geeks. And, you know, being a geek is not a bad thing. Um, it's a synonym for a committed, involved person. And what project doesn't want committed, involved people? So we shouldn't beat ourselves up too much about that. But at the same time, you know, we do talk a lot, and rightly so, about how OpenStreetMap isn't diverse enough. And one way to fix that is through fixing geek culture uh, and our part of it, and making it so it's more welcoming and a better environment. But another part of it is about making OpenStreetMap, a project that doesn't just appeal to geeks, that can bring in other people from other walks of life. Because if we mostly appeal to geeks, if we mostly uh, appeal to our existing base, then we are going to get all the demographics that come with that. So that's 80% male, 90% white, and 100% middle class, basically. Uh, whereas if we can broaden our appeal, if we can make OpenStreetMap more relevant and more interesting to more people, then we start to pull in the interesting of the different demographics from those groups. Now, we won't necessarily do that by doing the same things we've always done. Uh, I mentioned on Twitter a few weeks ago that uh, I was thinking along these lines, and uh, Ian said, you know, please don't tell people that mapping parties will solve all your problems. And he is right. We can't just do the same things we've always done to build our community. The things we've always done have built the community we have at the moment. That is terrific, but it won't necessarily take us further on. So I'd like to explore something new. Back in the early days, this is how we mapped. And to a large extent, it is still how we map. Uh, you have a GPS set, you have a um, notepad, and maybe you have a camera as well. Now, of course, that's three different things. Um, these days, we have them all in one device, which is the smartphone. And you might remember that Steve Jobs, when he introduced the first modern smartphone, the iPhone, 
Um, that was his slide. It was three things. He said, I'm unveiling a widescreen iPod, I'm uh, in unveiling a mobile phone, and I'm unveiling a personal internet communicator. And the joke was, this is three separate products, and then he said, do you get it yet? You know, it's just one product, it's all in one box, and it's called the iPhone. And it turned out that the magic of the iPhone was not that there were these three separate things, because of course they'd all been done before. People already had iPods, people already had phones. But the fact that the design worked so well together. And this is what we want. This is what we need to achieve. We don't need to break new ground in technology with what we're applying to OpenStreetMap. What we need to do is make sure that the design is good enough that more people can come in, that more people can start using it than ever before. So we need to think about smartphone editors. And there's been a lot of work on that in recent years. You know, there's some really good stuff. Um, GoMap and Vespucci are two really good programs that stand out. Uh, this is another one, OSM Tracker, I think. Um, at heart, things like GoMap and Vespucci are very much like the editors that we use on the desktop. They're fully-fledged uh, editors which, with which you can edit anything in OpenStreetMap. They're incredibly powerful, incredibly flexible. They're essentially like mobile versions of JAWS and ID and Potlatch. Not everyone wants that sort of editing to be part of their story. Um, so we want to think about easier contributions, about more frictionless contributions, easier ways to get your knowledge and your enthusiasm into the OpenStreetMap database. So what I would like to suggest, propose today, is an idea that I'm calling smart editors. Smart because what they do is they do more of the work and you, as the mapper, do less. The idea is that you use all the technology that your smartphone gives you, sensors, ex ex, um, existing data that you pull down from the servers, third-party sources, to make editing much easier rather than you having to draw absolutely everything from first principles. And I'll give you an example, because that all sounds a bit abstract. Um, we are always being exhort uh, exhorted to put more addresses in OpenStreetMap. Now, I don't know if anyone here has done any significant level of address mapping, but it's re Paul has, Paul has. There's dedication for you. It is really deathly boring. Am I allowed to say that? Um, you're just trudging up and down with this notepad, taking down all these addresses, and it's, it's not a whole bunch of fun. It's not how I necessarily want to spend my weekends. It's not for humans. Yeah, there you go. Good way of putting it. And I think there is possibly one way which you could do it. You could take a lot of the drudgery about, uh, out of it by walking along and saying, house number one, house number three, house number five, and having a servant behind you, sort of putting all of this into OpenStreetMap. But I'm not sure that we can necessarily justify mapping servants as part of the future of OpenStreetMap, much though it might be nice. Well, actually, it turns out that we can build our own servants, that we can do this automatically. So this is a proof of concept. This is real code. This is sitting here at uh, GitHub, at the address on the bottom. If you have uh, an iPhone developer account, you can play with this. Um, you walk along the road, and you say, on the left, number one. On the left, number three. Left one, left three, left five. The app repeats it to you. It says, there you go, left one. That's what you said. I've understood. And it makes a little note. And how it works is that it looks up the street name from OpenStreetMap. It passes what you said works out the position 10 meters to the left of where you are, 10 meters to the right, and it saves that into OpenStreetMap as an address node. It's that simple. When you say save addresses, it says saving addresses, goes off to the server, and it saves. And this is a real thing. This actually works. So this is some mapping I did the other day with it. As you can see, there are house numbers on a road in Chalbury where I live. Uh, I've never really done any address mapping before, but actually I just walked up this street and said left one, left three, left four, and it did it. And just to show you real live data, there you go, that's one of them. That is what, what has gone into the database. No clicking involved anywhere in this. This is just talking to the database. So all good fun. And a big shout out as well, of course, to Sarah and to Brian, our Nominatium developers, who mean that when I put this into the database, um, five minutes later it's searchable and you can go and put this in. And you know, I think this is great, the fact that you can just talk to your, uh, talk to your phone, absolutely no um, absolutely no clicking required, and within five minutes it's searchable. That's a, a really good thing to aim for. So there's a lot more we could do with voice recognition, and there's other things as well. There's image recognition. Um, sorry, that's just an ex excerpt from the code. Um, it's, it's not a good bit of code. Uh, this is just something I put in there. Tom is already throwing darts at me because of the various uh, infelicities I've committed in that code. Uh, it's not a great example of how to code things, but it's an example of how things can be done. So, there's image recognition. That can be an interesting thing as well. That's Mapillary, which um, some of you will know. Um, 
the, the server-based approach, this is some of the stuff that the guys at Strava are doing in taking um, sensor data from all the GPS cyclists uh, and um, getting map results out of that. The huge amounts of stuff we can do if we think differently about the editing experience. Now, as I say, this really isn't new technology at all. Um, the first road sign detector was actually back in 2012, uh, just as the iPhone wasn't really new technology. But we need to make all of this mainstream. We need to make editing OpenStreetMap via smartphones a mainstream and an enjoyable experience, something that's easier, quicker, and cooler. We find that the, uh, the whole, you know, I said earlier that OpenStreetMap has become becomes something when more people want to use it. Uh, more people are now using OpenStreetMap than ever before. And so we have to make sure that the editing experience keeps pace with that. That all these people who are seeing it in Foursquare, in Apple Maps, in whatever, can go and edit just as easily as um, they should be able to. And there's a, a wider dimension to that as well, which is that we're at the cusp of an era, I think, where millions of people in the developing world are about to get their first smartphones. Uh, Sundar Pichai at Google calls this the next billion smartphone users. Um, most of them do not live in places that currently have accurate, detailed maps, maybe not any maps at all. And they, rather than us, are the best placed people to build these maps. And so we need to give them the tools with which they can do that. Um, I pulled this next slide in right at the last moment last night because this is something Erica Cargan, who was one of the founders of Map Kibera, has just posted. I'd really encourage you to read this. It's on her Medium blog. And she's saying what we need to start looking at is basically giving people around the world an opportunity to map for themselves. And there is so much that we can do. So let's do this. Let's build an open street map contribution, uh, contributions app for iPhone and for Android and for whatever else you want so that you can contribute your knowledge without having to go through the whole current slow, long-winded ex uh, editing experience. This last slide might look a bit random, but I'm just putting this here to point out that I am not standing up here saying that I'm going to write a new editor because there are people out here who have got lots and lots of experience with um, making good iPhone apps. There are people out here who've got lots of experience with um, image recognition and stuff like that. Degrees in image recognition. I haven't got a degree in image recognition. I've got a degree in Anglo-Saxon. This is not going to be a lot of use for writing that app. However, what it might be useful for is this situation, which is I was thinking that you could actually combine a speech recognition app with a um, cycling navigation map so that when you're cycling and this happens to you and you get cut up by a bus and you say an Anglo-Saxon word into your app, then um, the app detects it and instantly puts an open street map that this is a dangerous place and then you never know, cycle.travel might route you around it. So thank you very much. This is quick thanks to everyone who has sent in their story and contributed. Thank you all. And this is me. <laughs>